this is going to be a talk on what I'd like to refer to as the Ewing's family of tumors. I borrowed this fantastic infogram from Karen Pinto. With her permission, of course, this beautifully illustrates the four families within what used to be called Ewing sarcoma. Remember, 20 years ago, we used to call all of these Ewing sarcoma. The four classes are the classic Ewing, we continue to use that term. The second family is the sick rearranged sarcomas. The third family is B core rearranged sarcomas. And the fourth and the final category is a sort of mixed bag that includes NFATC2 fusion tumors and the PADC1 fusion tumors. Ewing's is defined by the presence of a fusion involving FET genes and ETS genes. The common FET genes are EWSR1 and FUS. The common ETS genes involved are FLY1 and ERG. Potentially, any of these FET genes can combine with any of these ETS genes, but the most common ones are EWS FLY1, EWS ERG, and FUS FLY1. But remember, you can have combinations outside what I just said, and you can have fusions among ETS genes particularly that are not listed here. So in terms of numbers, EWS FLY1 is 85%, EWS ERG is 10%, and everything else is less common. This is a classic Ewing sarcoma. Fundamentally, this is a malignant brown blue cell tumor with very monotonous nuclei and often some necrosis. Here's what a classic Ewing sarcoma looks like. Malignant round cell tumor, monotonous round to oval nuclei. Typically, you do not see prominent nucleoli. You'll see fine chromatin, and you'll see a little bit of cytoplasm, which varies a bit, but in this case, it is pale eosinophilic. That's classic, right? But there's variations on the theme, and that's what we are here for to hear variations on that theme. And one of those variations is the fact that you can see fairly clear cytoplasm in some cases of Ewing sarcoma. That clearing results in also very distinct cytoplasmic membranes. The nuclei, you will notice, are very similar to the example I just showed you. Now, more variation on that theme. This is not that uncommon, where you see slightly more pleomorphic and vesicular cells in the center, and this more dark, smaller lymphocyte-like cells at the periphery, giving it this two-tone look. Cells with open chromatin and cells that more look like lymphocytes. More variation on that theme, and this is Ewing's, but it's distinctly more pleomorphic now. This is uncommon in Ewing's, but you do see it. You're now seeing slightly more pleomorphism. You're seeing slightly more prominent nucleoli. So now for a touch of history. Now in the 1990s, we call this a Ewing sarcoma with spindle cells. I do not have molecular information on this, but I would suspect that this would not today be classified as Ewing's if we did genetics on this. The bottom line is Ewing's, classic Ewing's, is rarely spindled. All right, some more history. Now this is a Ewing's forming rosettes. Now remember, this used to be called a primitive neurectodermal tumor, and that's because you have rosettes. Today, we would classify this as Ewing's. Again, occasionally, you'll see this pre-treatment, but often you'll see this post-treatment. This is differentiation following therapy. And of course, this is the ultimate form of differentiation following therapy. It's following that path of neuroendocrine differentiation and this time around forming ganglion cells with those big prominent nucleoli and that abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. Isn't that pretty? If there was only one marker that you were allowed to use to make a diagnosis of Ewing's, it would be CD99. What you're looking for is diffuse, virtually all of the cells should be positive, positivity for CD99. You're looking for cytoplasmic membranous reactivity. It tends to be fairly strong. Is this 100% specific for Ewing sarcoma? Absolutely not. There are other malignant round cell tumors that will stain for CD99. That said, 
it is pretty sensitive, right? So if you do not see this kind of reactivity, you're probably not dealing with Ewing sarcoma. When you see that diffuse membranous pattern of CD99 staining, your next stain, if you have it, should be NKX 2.2, strong nuclear membrane staining. Again, like many other markers, this is not specific for Ewing sarcoma, but extremely helpful when it's positive. And once you have a diffuse CD99 and an NKX 2.2 positive, in a sense, there's very few other things this could be. This is most likely Ewing sarcoma, provided your morphologic context is appropriate. And this is icing on the cake above and beyond icing on the cake. And we'll see why the WT1 and the ETV4 become relevant. In this context, it's probably not relevant. It was clearly negative in this case. And what about FLY1, right? So EWS R1, FLY1 fusion, the most common fusion. And indeed, in most cases of Ewing's, you do see strong nuclear reactivity with FLY1. The problem with FLY1 is it's not, at least in our hands, it's not a very specific antibody. I prefer to not use it at all. One major pitfall to remember, and that is about 20% of cases of Ewing sarcoma could be positive for keratin. And I'm not even talking about the adamantinoma like Ewing sarcoma. Do not let this stain lead you to call something a carcinoma. Quick summary, guys. Ewing sarcoma, brown cell tumor, diffuse CD99 reactivity, diffuse strong nuclear reactivity with NKX 2.2. Here's a mass in the thigh of a relatively young boy. He was 22 years old. And when you see this under low power, it clearly looks like a malignant round blue cell tumor, right? But what I want to draw your attention to the fact is that these, this particular tumor does not quite look like the tumor we just saw. The cells are perhaps a little larger. They have vesicular nuclei. They have little prominent nucleoli, and perhaps they are even a bit spindle. Oh, definitely somewhat oval nuclei. And look at those little nucleoli. Now, could this be Ewing's? It could be, but I think you must explore other options at this point. And just to remind you, this is what classic Ewing's looks like. This was interestingly enough, again, a young man. He was 23. He had an intra-abdominal mass. And I wouldn't jump out and call this a malignant round cell tumor. The cells are, in fact, fairly spindled. Look at that. They look quite spindled. They, they have vesicular nuclei, little prominent nucleoli. And here's a third case, and I can't remember what the clinical context was, but this has a slightly myxoid character. The cells look, in fact, a little plasma cytoid. But I will point out to you that this looks lobulated. All three cases that I've just showed you are sick rearranged sarcomas. And sick rearranged sarcomas tend to have the somewhat atypical morphology but they also tend to have this rather lobulated phenotype. Again, notice that slightly bubbly myxoid background, the somewhat plasma cytoid oval cells with those little prominent nucleoli. Now, can I distinguish a sick rearranged sarcoma from a Ewing sarcoma based on h &E? The answer is unfortunately, absolutely not. You do need immunohistochemistry and the first time that you should think of a sick rearranged sarcoma is when you see a CD99 reactivity like this. You'll remember that Ewing shows diffuse membranous reactivity. The vast majority of sick rearranged sarcomas will show this patchy membranous pattern of reactivity. Now, the moment you see that patchy reactivity, the next two stains you order should be ETV4 and WT1. This is WT1, diffusely and strongly positive. This case also showed strong reactivity for ETB4. And often, that is enough to make a diagnosis of a sick rearranged sarcoma. The right morphology, patchy CD99 staining, diffuse strong reactivity for WT1 and ETB4. And the reason I say that it's often enough to see just that is because detection of this fusion with our NGS techniques has proven to be a problem, really an issue related to pseudogenes and there are other issues involved as well. You can get fish, but that turns out to be equally problematic. So this is one of these sarcomas 
that often people are happy with just morphology and immunohistochemistry. All right, just one word about the fusion. One of these partners is always sick. The other 95% of cases is ducks for, but there are other alternate partners involved as well in a small proportion of cases. And you probably know what's coming next. It's the sarcoma with B core alteration. And I promise you this will be brief. These look like malignant brown cell tumors. They do not look like classic Ewing's, but they look in that family, which is exactly why they used to be classified as Ewing's. Malignant brown cell tumor, perhaps not classic for Ewing's. It looks a little more primitive, more open chromatin, little nucleoli. But if someone told me that this was genetically Ewing's, I'd say, oh, okay. The initial hint that you're not dealing with Ewing's comes from the CD99, right? So you get a biopsy one day, next day you see the CD99 stain, First day you're thinking Ewing's, next day you're thinking it's probably not Ewing's. And in fact, these B-core tumors, half of them are negative for CD99. And when you do see CD99 reactivity, it's patchy. This particular tumor obviously was totally, totally negative. With that CD99 reactivity or the absence of reactivity, the absence of NKX 2.2, which is a classic marker for Ewing's, makes perfect sense. So the next thing to go after is, is this a sick dux 4 Those are the next two stains I'll do. I'll do a WT1 and an ETV4. The reality is, of course, I order all of these at the same time. In this particular case, the WT1 and ETV4 were, were stains were both negative, which implies that this is very unlikely to be sick dux 4 and at that point, the next stain to get is B-Core. And what you're looking for is strong nuclear reactivity for B-Core. And there it is, nuclear reactivity for B-Core. Very focal faint reactivity I tend to disregard because there are other tumors that will show that level of B-Core reactivity. And only because you asked very nicely, here's another case, also B-Core rearranged sarcoma. Notice again, it looks somewhat atypical for Ewing's. The cells are slightly more spindled. In fact, the way I would describe this is this looks very primitive looking. So I will admit that I think we seldom reach out to a, for a molecular confirmation. Our next gen sequencing assay does not have B-Core in its panel, and we do not have a fish-based assay to look for the B-Core CCNB3 fusion. So we rely on the immunohistochemistries. And of course, there are two variants of alteration. One is the fusion, and the other is the so-called internal tandem duplications, which is a story for another day. I'm gonna apologize for this, but this is where things get really complicated. This is the fourth group, the so-called brown cell sarcomas with EWS non-ETS fusions. This is enough to make any sane man go insane, right? So there are two classes of tumors in this group. Perhaps there's going to be others added eventually. The first is an EWS R1 NFATC2 fusion, and the second is an EWS R1 PADS1 fusion. I'm going to be talking only about the PADS1 fusion just for the sake of simplicity. So what is this ETS, non-ETS stuff all about? Now, back to our classic Ewing's, right? So all Ewing sarcoma harbor a FET ETS fusion. So the FET genes are EWS R1 most commonly, less commonly FUS. The ETS genes are listed here. A Ewing sarcoma has one of this and one of that, right? So those are the two partners. This group that we're talking about, that's the fourth group we're talking about, is a tumor group with a gene fusion that involves on one hand a FET gene EWS R1, that's very similar to Ewing sarcoma, but unlike Ewing sarcoma, the other partner is a non-ETS genes. And the two non-ETS genes are NFATC2 or PADS1. So the fusions are EWS R1, NFATC2 or EWS R1, PADS1. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a case and I'm gonna show you the way we worked through this case and I can assure you the first time I saw one of these, I was as baffled as you are going to be shortly. So this was a young woman, 
This was an intra-abdominal mass. And what you're seeing is what looks like a round blue cell tumor here with a lot of fibrosis. So no question, a lot of fibrosis. It looks largely like a round blue cell tumor, but there are probably areas that are spindled. So here there's more spindling on one side. The other side looks more brown cell. Is this typical of Ewing's? Probably not. Could I squeeze this into Ewing's? with great difficulty perhaps. But the CD99 was pretty diffusely positive. And I, as like I told you, if you see a diffusely positive membrane staining CD99, Ewing's goes very high up on the differential diagnosis. So we certainly had Ewing's in the differential. Next step, as is often the case, is either immunohistochemistry for NKX 2.1, those were the days where you did not have the antibody, or you could get fish for EWSR1, which is what we got. And lo and behold, the fish is positive. Now is this Ewing's? But wait, hold your horses, there's more coming. Here's more tumor. Again, it looks very sclerotic, but it's extremely spindled. This is not Ewing's phenotype clearly spindled morphology, and now it's just overtly spindled. Now I'm sort of thinking of maybe perhaps this is a solitary fibrous tumor. Could this be a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor? Is this even a fibrosarcoma? It clearly looks atypical, right? And then there are areas that look like perhaps a malignant round cell tumor, but this time around, there's a lot of cytoplasm. So this is just a very confusing morphology. But there's more confusion in store. This tumor was pretty diffusely positive for Desmond. Not every cell is positive for Desmond, but a lot of these cells are positive for Desmond. Now, when you get a malignant round cell tumor that's, or a spindle cell tumor like this, that is positive for Desmond, the next stain you must do is myogenin and myoD1. And here's the myogenin, the myoD1 was also positive. You can see occasional cells that are positive for myogenin. Do not ignore these cells. Some rhabdomyosarcomas are very focally positive for myogenin. Now the question comes, now is this a rhabdomyosarcoma? The mystery deepens, right? Oh my gosh, now it's also positive for GFAP. What in the world is going on here? And it is positive for S100. So this now belongs to the, to the group of tumors that have a polyphenotypic appearance on immunohistochemistry. A common polyphenotypic tumor is perhaps a desmoplastic small round cell tumor. Is it that? Or could it be a myoepithelial carcinoma? It's S100 positive. It's it's GFAP positive, but myopathelial carcinomas are not positive for Desmond, and this tumor was negative for keratin. So long story short, we ran our fusion assay. This assay allows us to identify an unknown partner if we have one partner in the mix. Our assay can detect EWSR1, and therefore we could identify an EWSR1 PADS1 fusion. This, as you might have guessed by now, is an EWSR1 PADS1 fusion sarcoma. This belongs to the class of EWSR1 non-ETS fusion sarcomas. So how do you suspect one of these tumors, particularly if you do not have the fusion assay? I think the key here is the majority of these tumors round and spindle shaped. They're very frequently in the abdomen. They are CD99 positive, and they're fish positive for EWSR1. And I think the kicker here is the polyphenotypic phenotype. So when you see a polyphenotypic phenotype, you might see a little bit of keratin, CD34, Desmond, myogenin, S100, GFAP, that sort of crazy polyphenotypic phenotype should make you think of tumors like a desmoplastic small brown cell tumor, but should also make you think of this tumor, the EWSR1 PADS1. So that's the roundup of the, these four classes of small brown cell sarcomas that in the past would have just gone under the rubric of Ewing sarcoma. We now divide them into classic Ewing's, sick rearranged, B-core alterations, 
and the non-ETS fusion cases. Again, I've got to thank Karen Pinto for allowing me to use these beautiful infograms. And I'll leave you with this infogram, which compares the age, site, and prognosis of these four groups of round cell sarcomas.